Uh, actually, I thank the organizers because uh, they gave me this uh, opportunity to fill uh, one slot that uh, became unfortunately available. Uh, but I'm actually very happy that I had this chance uh, to tell you something about these new results that we have in studying N equals A supergravity. I'm very excited about the results we have, and I hope uh, that I can uh, uh, show you that uh, we have found something uh, rather interesting. And the four things I'm going to tell you are uh, based on four papers. Three are already out, and the fourth one is coming, uh, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in the first one, well, two of them are, uh, three of them, actually, with Gianluca Terzo, my former master student and now PhD student in Rome. A uh, couple of them are with Fabio Zwirner in Padova, one with Mario Trigente uh, of the uh, Turin Politecnico, and uh, the last one uh, will be also uh, Francesca Catino, who's a PhD student. Well, now she finished the PhD with uh, Fabio uh, Zwirn. So it will be on N equals A supergravity, as the title said, and so the point is why we should be interested in N equals A supergravity uh, again. Uh, 2012 is a remarkable year because of this uh, uh, discovery of this uh, particle, which is uh, Higgs like. And uh, that, of course, is a fundamental step in confirming the standard model, but, of course, we are eager to go beyond. And the hope was to find something with LHC that uh, would be at the TV scale, for instance. But uh, the first results do not seem to be that encouraging. And, for instance, at, I was here quoting a couple of titles from uh, talks at ECHEP. You see that uh, people are uh, starting to be worried about the fact that we will uh, eventually find something at the TV. And so the point is to start looking at uh, uh, the uh, other kind of physics that we may, be, uh, we may need to understand at some point. And for sure, uh, even though we've heard uh, already in this conference that there may be some other physics at some intermediate scale, uh, higher than the TV or uh, beyond, uh, still, we are sure that at least there should be another scale that is uh, uh, interesting, that is the quantum of quantum gravity. Of course, uh, the point is which quantum gravity theories you want to study. And obviously, uh, at least in this audience, I guess there are many string theory lovers, of course. Uh, we will be interested in understanding better string theory and in understanding possibly also these low energy effective theories, which are supergravity theories and things like that. Now, unfortunately, we have this issue right now of understanding exactly how to go down from the 10 dimension to 4 and to obtain real phenomenology out of string theory because of this uh, uh, possible landscape of vacua, even though what we need really is just one uh, vacuum that describes our universe. And so the uh, line of uh, thought that I'm following here is that of really looking at some highly constrained theory uh, where well-defined calculations can be carried out in order to better understand at least a uh, framework problems that may have a more general impact on all possible supergravity theories. So for this reason, I want to focus really on the maximally, maximally supersymmetric theory. Just like people have been studying the maximally supersymmetric n equals 4 uh, superior theory, uh, and understanding this theory, understanding how to really solve it uh, until the end, uh, one could learn lots of interesting uh, lessons which can be carried, over, carried on to uh, less supersymmetric theories and even to QCD. So uh, the idea is to study N equals A supergravity, of course. And as I said, uh, it's, there's an again here, because people have been looking at N equals A supergravity in the past and have been looking extensively at N equals A supergravity. At the beginning, uh, with the idea in mind that uh, it could be used as a unified framework for gauge uh, interactions and gravity. But of course, we know that it failed. Uh, I mean, even though one could find models where have a gauge group that is SU3, SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1, uh, you cannot have uh, chiral fermions in N equals A supergravity. So uh, the idea to use uh, N equals A supergravity as a framework for uh, unification, of course, failed. But nowadays, N equals A supergravity has come back for several different reasons uh, as an important uh, uh, object of study. The first one, and we've heard a lot about this in this uh, conference, is the possible, possi possible finiteness of the theory, perturbative finiteness of the theory. And uh, of course, this refers really to just one 
particular type of n equals supergravity, which is the so-called ungaged theory, the theory that you get from compatifying n theory on a seven torus, for instance, and you go down to four dimensions. Uh, however, there may be other supergravity theories that have uh, Minkowski vacua that are not anymore these compatifications on a torus, and one could uh, uh, try to ask the question whether also these theories have the same cancellation properties of the divergences that the uh, N equals A supergravity view that you think from the compatification has. So it is interesting, first of all, to understand if there are any other Minkowski vacuum. Actually, we know that there, are, there was at least one, but now we have many more, and as I will show you. And it would be interesting to understand whether these other theories also share the same properties of the N equals A supergravity that we've studied so far, uh, in order to understand better what are really the uh, the symmetries, the properties that are behind these uh, miraculous cancellations. Another obvious application of N equals A supergravity is in the context of the EDS-CMT uh, duality. Of course, uh, people have been studying since the uh, ABJM model uh, uh, four-dimensional supergravity theories with ads vacua in order to uh, study conformal field theories in three dimensions and also the formation of these conformal field theories and various models uh, uh, of uh, which can have applications to matter. So understanding better, of course, N equals A supergravity, the gauged supergravity in this case, uh, can be very important for that uh, uh, reason. And then there is the uh, main reason that drove me actually into this business, which is the fact that uh, uh, we would like to understand how to obtain the Sitter vacuum, vacuum with positive energy in the context of supergravity and instant theory. Of course, there is the KKLT model, but uh, it is still, we don't have really a single example that really works out in all details uh, that, uh, that, uh, may, that really realizes this KKLT model. And uh, as we know, even though in N equals one supergravity is not that difficult to create, the stable or metastable, of course, the Sitter vacua in a supergravity theory, as soon as you go beyond n equals 1 and you start going n equals 2, for instance, you already find that we have only one model so far. And beyond n equals 2, we don't have any model of the Sitter vacua uh, that, have, uh, that, have, that are stable or metastable. Uh, so it seems that already at the level of supergravity, it is uh, almost impossible to realize uh, uh, metastable vacua with a positive value of the uh, cosmological constant, it would be interesting to understand really what is the origin of this difficulty. And for this reason, again, N equals A supergravity being a unique theory with a unique multiplet with uh, uh, very constrained interactions may tell us very interesting lessons about that. So as I said, I started really looking at these uh, theories because of the uh, search of the Sitter vacua, but then as soon as we went looking at this, we realized that there were many other interesting vacua that one could find that people didn't uh, realize were there, and even more theories, as I will show you, that people didn't realize were there, which are very interesting and for various purposes. And so uh, I'd like to tell you a bit about that. So the first thing is, as I said, it would be interesting to understand better the landscape already of Minkowski vacua, because uh, we know, as I said, that the uh, ungaged theory has miraculous cancellations uh, at the perturbative level, uh, in the unga uh, in the in a theory, of course, which is being engaged doesn't have a potential, but we have at least one way to get uh, Minkowski vacua in N equals A supergravity where supersymmetry is spontaneously broken, and this is the Scherk-Schwarz mechanism. And this is, was actually the unique way we had so far to obtain Minkowski vacua uh, in N equals A supergravity since 1979 till last December, essentially. From the gauge supergravity point of view, this is uh, so-called flat group gauging. I mean, it's essentially just the product of a U1 with uh, some uh, translations. Uh, and the interesting uh, properties of this model is that all the masses of the, spec of the, of the model are classified essentially by uh, the charges of the various fields with respect to this U1. And there are essentially four mass parameters which you can uh, introducing this theory in such a way that you can break supersymmetry from n equals a to n equals six, four, two, or zero, depending on how you uh, choose these values. From the quantum point of view, uh, there's been, of course, uh, some work on this uh, theory already uh, soon in 79, 80, when uh, the theory was proposed uh, by Sejin van Nevenhuizen, who computed the one loop and proved that the theory, this particular Scherk-Schwarz uh, model is uh, one loop finite, 
that has a negative potential in one loop. So even though you start from a Minkowski vacuum, you end up with an anti Sitter vacuum after you get the, you take into account the one loop contribution. And this has to do with some, uh, has to do with the uh, supertrace relations that Ferrara and Zumino uh, proved uh, uh, to be valid for this uh, Shirk-Schwarz uh, mechanism because of this particular embedding of U1 in SP8. I mean, this is a technical point, but the result is rather interesting. Now, of course, this is, this was a single example, and since last year we didn't have, uh, un until last year we didn't have any other possibility to get to uh, Minkowski, to get Minkowski vacuum in any quasi supergravity. So, of course, people didn't look much uh, at uh, quantum properties or other properties of these uh, models beside this because, as I said, uh, already at the one loop, uh, you see that the, even though the theory is finite, it goes from a cost to uh, an anti sitter vacuum. But we will see that we, we had found actually now many more new interest in vacua. The other classes of, class of vacua that are interesting, of course, are the anti sitter vacua. And in particular, of course, the theory that, one theory that is uh, rather important is the SO8 gauge supergravity, which you have in N equals 8, uh, which you can obtain as a consistent truncation of M theory on the seventh sphere. And this also was believed to be unique. Uh, this is important because it's dual to the, well, it's important by itself, of course, but it's, uh, it's been used a lot uh, lately because it's dual to the uh, N equals 8 setup in the N equals 8 ABGM theory. And of course, the vacua of this theory are dual to deformations of the ABJM theory. And of course, people used a lot this uh, N equals 8, SO8 gauge supergravity, for instance, to uplift black hole solutions to M theory, uh, and in general, to understand solutions of M theory via the, uh, the four-dimensional supergravity theory. And again, what I will show you is that now we have a dramatic change in this respect, too. In fact, what I'm going to tell you are uh, that is that we found uh, many, well, some new uh, classical properties and some new quantum properties. The first thing is that we have a new method for classifying and finding vacua, which provided uh, us many new vacua very effectively in an analytic way, not just numerically. And uh, we have proved the, that actually there are many more classes of gaugings that you can do. So for instance, this SO8 gauge supergravity that people believe to be unique is actually, a one para, is actually one point in a one-parameter family of theories. And this means that we have many more theories to study. Then I will show you briefly uh, some recent work that uh, we are still finishing about some new ways of breaking supersymmetry in this N equals A gauge supergravity via the so-called CSO star models. And as I will explain later on, these models are a generalization of the shirk schwarz mechanism somehow. You can obtain, actually, the shirk schwarz mechanism as a particular limit of these uh, models that we have here. And the main difference is that uh, these models preserve still non-abelian uh, gauge symmetries on the, uh, on the vacua rather than just U1s like in the shirk schwarz case. Then we prove some uh, quantum properties that are general. So we prove that the supertrace relations that Sergio proved in the case of the schwarz theory actually are valid for any uh, gauge supergravity that has a Minkowski vacuum. And this implies the one-loop finiteness of the theory for any theory that is spontaneously broken to a Minkowski vacuum. And the other thing, unfortunately, that we proved, even though this is uh, not yet a general proof, but only a numerical proof in the examples that we had, is that is all these uh, vacua, once again, unfortunately are unstable uh, under this correction in the sense that they go from Minkowski, uh, the value of the cosmological constant is lower to a negative value, and hence you end up with anti de Sitter vacua. So for some reason, this I think is also interesting, again, in the perspective of looking for the Sitter vacua, because this is telling you that uh, not only is very difficult to find the Sitter vacua, which is stable, but already Minkowski vacua, are very difficult to keep as such, in the sense that quantum corrections of supergravity tend to push the value of the cosmological constant to more negative values. And so even Minkowski vacua uh, somehow are, uh, are not there anymore as soon as you introduce the quantum corrections. So supersymmetry really seems to aid not only uh, positive energy vacua, but even zero energy vacua, at least in the context of the N equals A. And it would be very interesting to understand better the origin of 
uh, of this fact. Let me go through the various results that I mentioned. So the first thing is about the vacuum of the theory. So as I said, an equal state supergravity has been studied since the 80s, and many people look for various vacua at the beginning uh, in the context of the SO8 gauge supergravity that I mentioned before that comes from the sphere compatification. And taking very large uh, residual symmetry groups, people could find rather easily uh, a certain number of vacua, which are all ADS, with different numbers of supersymmetries. The fact that people looked at uh, very large residual gauge groups uh, has to do with the fact that, of course, in N equals N supergravity, you have 70 scalars, so minimizing the potential is a mess because the potential is a non-polynomial function in general of these uh, scalars. And if you impose uh, that your residual vacuum has a large gauge group, of course, you can reduce the number of aqua which uh, can get above, and this is the way that people uh, looked for vacua in the past. Then, of course, people try to look for vacua in other models in order to find vacua that were not only uh, ADS, but also the Sitter or Minkowski. Of course, these are supersymmetry breaking vacua, but then we have also the Shirk Schwartz mechanism, which gives Minkowski vacua coming from N equals A. And that was more or less the situation, has been the situation for more than 20 years. Then, more recently, then from time to time, of course, there was somebody that would find a new vacuum of the SO8 theory, but uh, the situation more or less was uh, static for a few years. Then more recently, uh, since we have much more powerful computers, uh, Fischbacher started to find a vacua with uh, numerical approximations, of course, uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 creating some conjectures in order to uh, see whether this vacua could be found then analytically. Of course, some of these coincide with the vacua that we had seen before. And again, those with a large symmetry group are easy to find also analytically. The others are uh, vacua uh, within the error uh, that you get in doing this kind of approximations, of course. This is a progress, but of course, we would like not just to find vacua per se. We would like to find vacua in order to understand better the properties of the theory. And the interesting thing is that our method not only allows for an easy identification of the vacua, but it allows a very easy computation of the mass spectrum, the full mass spectrum of the theory, not just the scalars, which was already missing for the vacua that were known. The vacua that I listed before, most of the time were found, uh, but people didn't really compute the full mass spectrum, simply because already to find them, they had to uh, restrict the theory to a certain subsector with a certain number of symmetries, and then they couldn't really look for the whole uh, for the whole spectrum. And we found many interesting vacua. I'm not listing all of them. I put here just a table with few of them that I think are somehow more interesting than others. You see we have both new ADS, new De Sitter, new Minkowski vacua with different numbers of supersymmetry. And the interesting ones that I will discuss uh, a bit more in the uh, sequel are, for instance, this SO 6,2 vacuum, which uh, is actually uh, stable in a certain range of the uh, moduli space. Uh, and uh, this other vacua, for instance, uh, escape uh, the so-called exhaustive classifications that have uh, been done in the past. So with our technique, we could go somehow beyond some classifications that were done in the past. And this new class of vacua, uh, the CSO star in the CSO star models, which depending on the gauging, and again, depend on four parameters, as I will show you before, uh, again later on, uh, they will break supersymmetry again, as I said, to six, four, two, and zero, just like the Scherker Schwartz, but leaving an interesting non abelian group. So as I said, we are able to compute the full mass spectrum, and one of the interesting things is that, well, of course, we could find some which are stable. Here there are still some moduli, where some of these are, of course, the Goldstone bosons, because you break uh, the gauge group to uh, its compact subgroup generically on this vacua. No, uh, this is classically stable. Classically stable. Then the one loop I will discuss later on. Classically stable. Uh, it's written here. <laughs> and uh, we found some deceit vacua, but still, unfortunately, unstable. And uh, the interesting pattern that you see also here is that the masses are somehow fixed already by the symmetries. You see, we have here models, different models, for instance, with the SO8 gauging, SO7,1, SO7 times, well, this is essentially an ESO7 or something like that, and then uh, other gauge groups, more complicated, which have a residual SO6 symmetry, which have the 
same spectrum. So even though you would expect, of course, the masses of the fields to be organized in multiples of the residual symmetry, this, of course, doesn't fix the value. The surprising thing is that not only we have the same degeneracy of the masses, but we have the exactly same value for these models that have, this, that have the same residual symmetry. So it seems that the masses are essentially fixed by the large symmetry groups that we have in the residual theory. That is interesting and somehow still unexplained. Uh, the other general pattern, which is not yet explained, which I think is rather interesting, is that if the original gauge group was compact, we are able to find only ADS vacua. Whereas if the gauge group is not compact, we can find both ADS, the Sitter, or Minkowski. Then if you take this non-compact gauge group and the residual gauge group as some U1, then you get Minkowski vacua. And the fact that there is this U1 means that the masses are all Dirac masses. And again, this means that the breaking can go only from n equals 8 to 6, 4, 2, and 0. But you can never have a number of, super, of residual supersymmetries. And this is also, again, surprising, because from a kinematic point of view, you know that you cannot have n equals 5 or n equals 7. But in principle, that for is to get an n equals 3 vacuum or an n equals 1 Minkowski vacuum. And of course, if the result of the residual gauge group is semi-simple, then you still have the yes or the sita. So there is this pattern. I mean, so far, of course, having more vacua allows us at least to have a feeling of what is going to happen, even though we don't have an explanation for all of these, uh, uh, of these uh, facts that we find. The other interesting thing is that these uh, uh, vacua, in general, have a non-trivial moduli space. That is also very interesting because, for instance, the SO6,2 vacuum, and as I will mention again later on, all these CSO star vacua have a moduli space which is such that in some limit, if you go at the boundary of the moduli space, uh, you get exactly the same spectrum and the same interactions you would have if instead of that gauging, you would have done a, a Scherk Schwartz gauging. So it looks like if you shrink, I mean, if you would interpret the moduli as volumes of the internal manifold, if there is a compatification that leads to this theory, uh, if you uh, uh, go to the boundary of the space, it means that you have something to this manifold, that you are, for instance, shrinking to zero the volume of some of its cycle or something like that. And when you get to zero, you, you, you see that your modular space becomes the modular space, and the theory becomes, the, becomes a different theory, becomes the Scherk Schwartz theory. So it's like if you had. Uh, Excuse me. This picture is the is one uh, is the mass is given the mass of two of the moduli of the SO6,2 gauging, and uh, you have uh, uh, that these are real moduli again. I mean, these are massless at the SO6 cos SO2 vacuum, and then moving on the moduli space, you see that you further break this residual gauge group. Modular mass, yes, yes, no, 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 this, ah, sorry, yeah, uh, in this case, yeah, okay, so let me, yeah, uh, here it's in, 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 indeed uh, not correct, uh, but I mean, I have certain number of moduli, and in addition, I have some massless fields, and what I can see is that uh, moving in the moduli space, some of these uh, other fields get a mass or not, and in some cases, they can even become negative so that the model becomes unstable, so depending on where you are, uh, in the parameter space of the other moduli, you see that the masses of uh, the other fields changes somehow. These are two fields which depend on the, uh, this is the mass of two fields which depend on the value of uh, two of these moduli, on some of these moduli. Some of these yes, some others no, as I will show you later on. Uh, some of these were found before. Uh, this one, uh, for instance, th there is one in a paper by Hall which is very similar, but it's not exactly the one we are talking about here. Now, so how did we find this vacua and how we can connect this to M theory? Um, so, uh, of course, if you take M theory on, se on the seven torus, uh, of course, you can get a gauge supergravity by turning on various fluxes. You know you can turn on the seven form flux. You can turn on the uh, torsions if you have uh, a twisted torus compatification, for instance. Uh, you can turn on the four form flux that you have. But then you have many other deformations. And actually, we know now that n equals gravity 
classified by the 912 parameters in total, which are listed here. And these parameters tell you essentially how you couple the gauge vector fields that you have, both the electric and magnetic ga gauge vector fields that in principle you can have in your theory, to the uh, generators of the uh, E7 uh, uh, duality group. And of course, you cannot gauge any combination of these. Uh, and uh, the uh, generators that you are gauging depend on the, the values you specify for this object, which is called the embedding tensor. Uh, which uh, was uh, uh, somehow uh, a technique that has been developed uh, uh, recently by the people there, uh, and which has to satisfy a certain number of constraints, some of which are obvious, like uh, the fact that you have to have that the generators, the final generators, these XM are essentially the combination of theta with T. Uh, they have to close an algebra, of course. Uh, then you would like to have locality, of course. You cannot have uh, you cannot gauge a group which is bigger than 28 because you know that the original theory should have at most 28 vector fields. But of course, if you start introducing also the 28 magnetic, you have to introduce a constraint that is such that it uh, gets rid of half of them. And uh, supersymmetry tells you in the end that uh, this embedding tensor has to have at most 912 parameters, which are in a particular representation of E7. Now, depending on how you choose these, can, uh, of course, create this various theories that we have, and you can also link them to, uh, to M-theory. For instance, these fluxes are uh, the result of so-called geometric compatifications on M-theory on, on a torus. The Qs are the so-called locally geometric fluxes, but then it depends really on the frame, because, for instance, you know that when you compatify M-theory on a seven-sphere, you need to turn on, in addition, of, in addition to the seven-form flux, you need to turn on these other fluxes these other components of the embedding tensor, which in the framework of the T7 compatification are non-geometric, but obviously the compatification on the seven sphere is geometric. So the fa this, this distinction between geometric and, and non-geometric is really something that comes from the fact that people always think of the formations of the four-dimensional theory as uh, uh, the result of a reduction on a torus and then deforming the torus. But obviously the, there are some deformations, even geometric ones, which are not simple geometric deformations of the torus. You have to do something bad to the torus to make it uh, become a, a seven sphere somehow. Uh, but still, so what we did was to try to use our, our technique that I will show in a second uh, uh, to, uh, with a very simple embedding tensor, where only a few of these fluxes are turned on in such a way that the constraints that I showed you before are satisfied. And this means that we had all these gaugings that, were, that I've shown you before. Of course, the SO8 gauging, but also SOPQ, CSOPQR, and all these other gauges that uh, you have seen uh, in the table before. And this already gives a very interesting pattern. No. Uh, no, not really. Uh, the, 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 the SO8, the so eight gauging uh, can be understood as coming from S7, but of course the non-compact ones, for instance, do not come from S7 compatifications. There will be some of them, them you can understand as compatifications on an hyperboloid and imposing boundary conditions, but some others we don't know yet. So the technique is very simple, and it has to do with the fact that the scalar field space is homogeneous. So the scalar potential is generically, as I said, a very complicated function of the scalars, but it depends quadratically on the bedding tensor. So if you try to minimize this with respect to the scalar, you get a messy, uh, very complicated 70 conditions that you have to try to solve, and you're not usually able to do so. But what you can do is to use the fact that the space is homogeneous, and instead of minimizing a generic potential, so instead of fixing the value of the embedding tensor and looking for vacua in the uh, scalar field space, what you can do is you, can, you know you can use this uh, fact that the, manifold, uh, the scalar manifold is homogeneous to move any critical point to the origin. Of course, at the origin, it will be uh, the critical point of a theory which has a different embedding tensor. But you know how the two are related. They are, they are related by a duality transformation. So at the origin, the conditions which were very complicated in terms of the scalar fields, which cause, because they are non-polynomial, they become simple quadratic equations. So it means that you end up with a system where you have quadratic conditions, quadratic conditions coming from the uh, 
derivatives of the scalar potential and quadratic conditions coming from, uh, from the constraints that this embedding tensor has to satisfy. And just by looking at those, you can find vacua. And since these are quadratic conditions, they're not very difficult to solve, and you can do it completely uh, in an algebraic way, finding exact values for the vacua, the full mass spectrum, and also study more theories at the same time, because essentially, uh, in certain instances, you can uh, leave unspecified the sign of uh, some of these, uh, of the parameters of the embedding tensor, and this means that you can study at the same time compact and uncompact gauge. In addition to finding many vacua, what we found that is, I think, is extremely interesting is the fact that we realized that the landscape of these theories is much larger than expected. Because all these models depend, indeed, on the gauge group, but it depends also on its symplectic embedding. It depends really on how you embed this gauge group, and on how you choose the value of this embedding tensor. Now, the first known example of this gauge supergravity was indeed the SO8 gauge supergravity, which, as I said, comes from the se seven-sphere complication. But what I will show you now is that actually there is an infinite class of these models. And the idea is very simple. Of course, you'd like to gauge an SO8 group in E7, which must be also a subgroup, of course, of the full uh, electromagnetic duality group, which is SP56. But you can still choose how you embed this SO8. So, the fact that we actually have more than one way to do that uh, can be seen by the fact that if you decompose the 912 parameter in terms of SO8 representations, you find that there are two singlets. So the fact that you have two singlets means that there are at least two ways you can construct this SO8 gauge supergravity. And in fact, you could take your embedding tensor, now this CD indices, for instance, run on the SO8 generators, or in general, the SLA generators, if you want to generalize this to SOPQ and other gauge groups. You can use the uh, electric vectors to gauge the SO8. But of course, you could use the 28 magnetic vectors. Of course, if you use all electric or all magnetic vectors, the theory is essentially the same. There is just a duality transformation that maps one into the other. But you can also try to take a combination of the two. And then it's no more guaranteed that the two theories are related by a duality transformation. And that's exactly what we find. So the point is, for C equals 0, you have the old SO8 theory, the one of uh, Nikola David, and et cetera. But what about C different from 0? Are these theories the same as the previous one, the one by David and Nikolai, or not? So in order to, to understand that, we can do the same thing that has been done in the past for black holes which is to use duality invariance. To classify black holes, no, we generically use duality invariance and distinguish classes of black holes depending on the invariance that are constructed in terms of the charges. Now, no, no, C is the, ah, sorry. C is the parameter that appears here. So it's the, uh, essentially, it is you how much you are using, how much, uh, which combination of the electric and magnetic vectors you're using to gauge the SO8, essentially, is the old theory. Uh, and then, depending on the value of C, you get different combinations. And as I will show you, not all of these are equivalent. So you can try to construct duality invariance. Now, instead of the charges, of course, you'd like to use duality invariance constructed with the embedding tensor. Unfortunately, uh, if you take the quartic invariant that you have for the black holes, you see that this is identically vanishing. So instead of using duality invariance, we have to find a smarter way. And the way is to use objects which are not really invariant, but which have some quantities which are invariant. So for instance, this tensor is constructed, which is quartic again in the embedding tensor is not invariant itself. It transforms under duality transformations, but its eigenvalues are duality invariant. So we computed the spectrum of these eigenvalues as a function of this parameter, and what we saw is that indeed it depends on, the, on this parameter. Of course, the spectrum has some symmetry, so if you map C into minus C or C into 1 over C or C into C minus 1 over C plus 1, you get the same spectrum, which means that this theory may be equivalent. But for other values, which are in the range between 0 and uh, square root of 2 minus 1, 
if you convert this into angles and put c to be the tangent of an angle essentially is between 0 and pi 8, uh, then you find that, uh, uh, that all these gaugings are inequivalent. So we have a family of SO8 gauge supergravity, which depend on this parameter. And you can actually see it explicitly in the couplings and in the potential in particular. In the SO8 gauge supergravity that was constructed in the 80s, Warner classified immediately looking at the G2 truncation, uh, classified, found immediately that there were essentially six vacua. There was the SO8 N equals A vacuum. There were some SO7 vacua, which he calls SO7 plus or SO7 minus, depending on the parity properties, which are N equals zero, and two G2 vacua, which are N equals one, and there was nothing else. In our theories, which depend on the parameter, of course, the exact point where the vacua are, the value of the cosmological constant of this vacua changes depending on the parameter. But generically, what we find is that there are more than just those six. We find that there is at least one new, well, there is exactly one new SO7 vacuum, and there are two new G2 vacua. So we really can prove explicitly that these theories are different. I mean, we can really construct them, find the uh, scalar potential, construct the super, the, the, the sheet matrices of the fermions, which means uh, 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 compute the supersymmetries of this vacua, and you see that these are different theories, explicitly. Now, of course, this has a lot of implications. To begin with, uh, for instance, uh, in the context of the ADS-CFT, because this means that you have one theory which is n equals 8, which is dual to the uh, seven sphere compatification. But then you have, in principle, at least in gravity, a one parameter family of theories, which have all the same SO8 gauge, uh, SO8 vacuum, which has the same quadratic spectrum, but the interaction change. So, for instance, if you would, would compute three point functions or four point functions, of course, this would depend on the parameter that I had introduced before. Now, in, we don't know exactly yet to what this parameter corresponds, but if we look at the ABJM paper and the subsequent ABJ paper where they introduce fractional membranes, uh, you can see that you have three different theories at least which have still n equals eight in the truncation to four dimension, and which could be used as dual to our, uh, to our uh, uh, n equals eight gauge supergravity theories. These are the standard S7 compatification, the S7 mod Z2, and then S7 mod Z2 plus discrete torsion. Now, looking at the properties of this theory, the fact that some of these are, for instance, these two are completely indistinguishable from the four-dimensional point of view, and they are parity invariant, we believe that these are uh, connected, of course, to the C equals zero case, but for instance, this other example, you see is not really parity invariant, of course, you have a theory which is, uh, 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 not parity invariant, but which, if you essentially perform a parity plus a duality rotation, becomes, again, invariant. And this corresponds to the other value that we have, which has exactly the same property. So in this case, we see at least two points in our uh, space of deformation, which may correspond to dual theories. But we're not really 100% uh, sure that this is really the full story. There may be uh, more, more to this. Of course, in supergravity, as usual, since this parameter comes from duality transformation, it's continuous because we're in continuous transformations. In string theory, it will be at some point quantized. The other interesting thing is that we see that this parameter survives when you do symmetry, which means that it will still be there if you have an n equals 6, n equals 4, n equals 1 theory, which comes as a truncation to this. And for instance, this would be relevant if you start taking theories like ADS4 cross S7 mod ZK, which are the ABJM because then you have uh, more values of this parameter which now are allowed, and, the, and still we see this, uh, this degeneracy. So we've learned uh, many interesting things already at the classical level, and the last one I want to talk about very briefly is this additional uh, supersymmetry breaking mechanism that we have, which is a generalization, essentially, of the Scherzworth model. You know, in the Scherzworth model, you have a model which has four mass parameters. Depending on which parameters you turn on, you can get n equals 6, 4, 2, or 0, and the gauge group changes. But it's always the product of a U1 with some translations. And actually, you can find these models at 
superpositions of the basic ones. So if you start taking a gauge group like that, you start uh, charging essentially, well, you're superimposing you know, the, the, the charges of the various fields with respect to the U1, depending on how many of these mass parameters you turn on. So you turn on one, you turn on another one in a different direction, and then you start uh, breaking more and more supersymmetry. However, what we realize is that if you look at the SO star groups, the CSO star groups, you get exactly the same pattern, and you get exactly the same pattern exactly in the same way. Only that now I'm not superimposing parameters, I'm superimposing this embedding tensor. I construct the embedding tensor for the CSO star 2,0,6 case. I take two CSO stars 2,0,6 gauging in different directions. I superimpose them, and what I end up uh, with is a theory which has less supersymmetries uh, and a gauge group, which, however, now is not anymore U1, but it's U1 times SU2, SU3, or SU4, depending on the number of supersymmetries. So it's interesting, because we have, again, a supersymmetry breaking on Minkowski from n equals a to 6, 4, 2, and 0. However, now with a residual gauge group, which is non-abelian. And the other interesting thing is that, again, if you take the model space of the theory, and you take one of the modules, one of the modules, and you send it to the boundary of the modular space, you end up with exactly the Scherk-Schwartz theory. So it seems that this generalized the Scherk-Schwartz reduction. It would be very interesting to understand this from a stringy point of view. We know how to get the Scherk-Schwartz reduction from a stringy point of view. I have no idea personally on how to get this. And it would be, of course, very interesting because it would generalize the Scherk-Schwartz reduction and give a theory which has non-abelian uh, non uh, gauge group. So from the classical point of view, I showed you that we have a new method for finding vacua. We have found many new vacua with the full mass spectrum, and this lets us understand better how to get and when we get the Sitter and the Sitter and Minkowski vacua. We found this interesting relation between the masses and the residual gauge group, which is still unexplained. Also, the moduli space of these theories are very interesting. It seems that they talk to each other, like if they really came from some compatifications, from different compatifications. And then I prove this uh, interesting new result that we actually have infinite classes of gaugings for each of these parameters. The thing I did for SO8 can be done for any of these other theories. And again, you have families, infinite families of gaugings, which of course have different scalar potential and then different properties. Now, how, how I am? Two minutes? Three? Okay. So we really run through the last part, but I just want at least to mention the result on the quantum part. Because of course, now that we have this Minkowski vacua, you can start asking the question that Massimo asked before, for instance, what happens when you compute the one loop corrections? Now, the one loop divergences are controlled by the super traces. Uh, and you can see you have different divergences depending on uh, uh, quartic, quadratic, logarithmic, depending on the super trace, super trace of, of the masses to the zeroth power, second, quartic, and so on. And of course, the super trace of m to the zero is zero because the theory is, has a unique multiplet, supersymmetry multiplet. But of course, the super trace of the square masses and of the quartic masses, in principle, can be anything. And what we have found is that if you use, just use the fact that you are at a vacuum, so you use the critical point condition, you use the fact that you want a Minkowski vacuum, so you use the vanishing of the cosmological constant, and you use the quadratic constraints that define a consistent gauging, then the quadratic and the quartic supertrace always vanish for any gauge you do. Which means that the theory is one loop finite, no matter what is the gauging you do, provided you have a Minkowski vacuum. So on the Minkowski vacuum, the theory does not have those divergences that we've seen there. Now, of course, you would like to see what is the value, the actual value of the scalar potential. And for that, unfortunately, we are not able yet to prove uh, a general formula that lets us say whether the vacuum is always going to be destabilized to anti sitter but we could prove it at least for the examples that we had at hand. We realize that since there is always this U1 factor, all the masses are still classified for some reason in terms of the charge with respect to this U1 factor. And I will not go into the details. You can then uh, essentially write a mass formula for all the fields in terms of these charges. And then you can numerically, I mean, you can do a Monte Carlo and see that at least the one loop uh, uh, potential for this model is always negative. 
this means that, uh, unfortunately, as I said before, uh, quantum correction puts the value of the cosmological constant uh, to more negative values. So I think we have a remarkable result, which is the fact that at least you, now we know that any gauging you do will lead to a finite theory, a one finite one loop potential and calculable in principle. And uh, unfortunately, what we see is that the, again, in n equals eight, supersymmetry always pushes you to ADS rather than Minkowski. So as I said, this is also telling us that probably now that we, if we want to look for the seat there, the situation with the work. So far, all the decisions Bakwa did were unstable already at the classical level and and somehow, uh, if you would think that, would hope at least that maybe there is a way that the quantum correction would help you in stabilizing the thing and maybe lifting a bit the vacuum, uh, n equals a supergravity seems to go exactly in the opposite direction. So we've seen many things, but of course there are more than one can do. Uh, the first one, of course, is, as I said, Look for the sitter vacua, try to use our uh, chi now to uh, find more and more the sitter vacua and understand whether there is a general proof that these are always unstable or not. Uh, it would be interesting, of course, to understand better so this loop correction that is negative depends really on, is, is really established on a base example. It would be interesting to understand whether uh, the mass formula that we have is really general or to find some counter example. It would be interesting, very interesting to find the stringy uplift, especially because, uh, because uh, uh, we have now this generalization of the Scherzworth mechanism, which leads to uh, a more interesting, uh, from the four dimensional point of view, vacua. And it would be interesting to understand whether there is any way to get it from string theory. And of course, it would be very interesting to understand the nature of this obstruction to having a positive or zero cosmological constant in n equals a supergraph. Uh, uh, is it really just supersymmetry? Or is it again some other symmetry that we have in this uh, in these models? Uh, we don't know. And of course, the last thing is that we can have many applications now that we have these uh, new classes of gaugings and new vacua. We can have uh, many more uh, deformations of the ABJM theory, ABJ theory, and so on. And uh, of course, it will be very interesting to try to understand now. Uh, better the landscape of the vacua there to understand which deformations are captured by our theory, which ones are not, uh, eventually, possibly, and, and, and so on. So there is still a lot of work, and I hope I will uh, be able to report about it uh, another time. Gianguido, questions? Do you hear me? Okay. I don't know, a long time ago with Nick Warner, we wrote a paper titled To Be or Not To Be, that is the question, in which we gave a gauging of 5D and equalization for gravity with SO star 6 gauge group, mm -hmm. which admitted a Minkowski vacuum with two supersymmetries. Okay. The ground state was SG3 cross U1 invariant. I believe the reduction of that gives you the, one of your, uh, the Shrug Schwartz gauging root to supersymmetry. My question to you is, does that belong to an infinite family or is that unique? Uh, these, I mean, the, the, the same SO star, sorry, the same we did for the SO, so for the SO star. Yeah. And in principle, when you do this deformation, some of the vacua appear, as I showed you before, but in some other instances, some of the vacua disappear when you introduce the deformation. So we should do the computation. It's not difficult. We can do it. Okay. We didn't do it yet, but uh, yeah, it, I don't know it, it answer mean, to your yeah, question. Yeah, 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 we have to sit and compute and see okay. whether the vacuum is still there. Okay, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, thanks. Is the, the sitter vacuum at a fixed cosmological constant as a function of M Planck, or can you make it as small as you want 
or at least small. Well, you have a parameter here, which is, of course, the coupling constant, which you can tune as you like in supergravity, so. Yeah, but if you want to give the coupling constant, say, a fixed value because it's the string constant or something, then that's a, no, so then you, you, you get cannot. the usual relation. Then you cannot, of course, depending on yeah. the gauging, then uh, the value of the cosmological instant. It's essentially g squared and Planck to the fourth, right? Give or take, like in old supergravity. Yeah. The, the new vacuum which you compute, you have them for specific values of your new parameter C, or it is no a for any value ex except C equals zero. So it is a continuous function of C. It is a continuous function. Vac. So the what number. happens is, if we look at, the, let me just go to the picture. So this picture is taken at a particular. Now it disappeared. Okay, the picture I show, oh, here it is, again, sorry. It's taking a bit because it's uh, rather heavy, unfortunately. Uh, so this picture is taken for a particular value of C, but as soon as you have C different from zero, you start having these three vacua. The value of the, the, value of the cosmological constant changes depending on C. Yes. So depending on which value you fix for C, the value of the cosmological constant changes, the position of this vacua changes a bit, so really so C-dependent, but it, 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 is, it is there for any value of C except for the n equals yeah. a theory. My degree. question was, so the example you're showing for C equals 1 over 4, but you have a formula for any C yes, 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 yes. zero. Yes, yes, yes. We actually, in our paper, we actually have the formula. I mean, even though our method uh, doesn't use, in principle, the, uh, the potential written as a function of the scalars, no? Because, mm -hmm. as I said, I use the embedding tensor. In our paper, we actually have a formula for the scalar potential in terms of all the scalars G2 truncation. So it of the potential and, on the, and of the A matrix which determines this number of supersymmetries. Mm -hmm. So there you see the dependence on the parameter and you can compute everything explicitly. So it's a similar question, but uh, uh, on this parameter, you show that they are inequivalent if they are between zero and square root of two minus yeah. one. So is that the full moduli space of inequivalent vector you get from this? Or is it the full, sorry? Is it the full moduli space of inequivalent SO8 vector, or did you check only that they were different in that So case? what, uh, no, what we did, uh, we computed this invariant, so this is an invariant in gauge supergravity, so uh, this is, uh, doesn't depend on where you're coming from, okay? but. Uh, what, we, what we can say is simply that for, tho, for the value of C in that region, uh, the vacuum are inequivalent, obviously, because you get different invariants. Of yep. course, if you have two models that have the same value, still uh, there may be some other invariant that changes, and uh, we don't know that. Okay, so, it's an... so it could be that there's a finer uh, resolution that one has to introduce to really remove all the degeneracy. But at least already there, we know that we have inequivalent vacuum. Then if I look at the potential, honestly, uh, uh, we see that the potential has exactly the same symmetry. So, I mean, you construct the theory explicitly and you see that the symmetries are exactly those. So that the potential doesn't cha changes in the range between zero and uh, square root of two minus one, but it doesn't change uh, uh, when you go beyond that. So I believe that this is really everything you can have. And ca can you understand that through the, the inequivalent embedding of SO8 inside E7? Or? What do you mean? I mean, it's. Uh, and each time you should gauge a different SO8 inside the 77. Right? Well, you are, you are, you are, I mean, that's exactly what I showed before somehow. No, the, the, we have this, uh, the embedding tensor is changing. So uh, the fact that uh, that, uh, that is, all, is the only range uh, is not really explicit from the way you construct the embedding. The only way is really to construct the invariant. I wouldn't know how to, how to see it in another way. I mean, I would be happy to to know if there is any other way that comes to your mind, but. Okay, maybe, so just to 